Uh, well, thanks for thanks for coming, Terry Bosman. I'm a philosopher. Terry, my co-author, is uh, a computer scientist. Um, really um, that's the book. Um, so, if there are any hard technical questions, I'll refer them to Terry, who's uh, currently in Australia. Um, so, I think initially distinguish between we often hear cyber security, cyber safety. I think it's probably important to try to make a make some sort of distinction there. Um, so entirely accidental harm perhaps is a safety issue, intentional harm looks to be a security issue. And then there's a bit of an issue about um, actions or outcomes that are harmful that may not have been intended, but there may be some maybe blameworthy in some sense. Um, so there might be as a consequence of culpable negligence. And so I'm gonna suggest that perhaps those actions should be under the banner of um, cyber security. Um, another point about uh, cyber security is uh, that a lot of people define it in terms of essentially in terms of data security. I think that's a I mean, that's a useful definition. Um, but it's it's somewhat narrow, and I prefer a wider definition. So data security pertains to the confidentiality of information breached by data theft, the integrity of information which might be uh, breached by unauthorized changes to the data, and the availab availability of information, as in obviously data destruction makes it unavailable, but also, if you say, in, in the instance of ransomware, with, uh, when the data is encrypted and no longer be able to uh, be accessed by the people who would have belonged to. Um, so I think data, the data security definition is fine for what it is, but it's a bit too narrow since it excludes a whole lot of information and communicative internet use, for example, such as incitement to violence, um, online grooming, child sex abuse, ransomware, defamation, computational propaganda, things here at Cambridge Analytica, the interference in the US presidential elections. And cognitive warfare, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So I think we need a wider definition, and um, I think a definition, perhaps in terms of cyberspace, is um, going to have great utility. Okay, so in the book, the look at a range of issues, including those ones I just mentioned, um, and the idea is that. Uh, to identify some of the key relevant ethical guidelines, so cybersecurity ethics and collective responsibility. Try to identify some of the key um, ethical or moral, if you want to use those terms interchangeably, uh, principles that are in play and how they ought to be applied uh, in the in the in the various different in the various different contexts and in relation to the various different issues, whether or not it's um, issues of privacy, issues of uh, disinformation, or, or indeed um, cultural warfare, as I'll talk about, criminality of various kinds, and so on. So let me give you an example, um, just to give you a sense of, of the sort of ethical guidelines and principles that we're seeking to identify. Let's think about Privacy, that's a complex set of issues. But the right to privacy arguably is not an absolute right. That is, it's a, it's a right that could be uh, reasonably overridden under certain circumstances. So it's important, but it's not absolute in the sense that um, it can be overridden in relation to other considerations. So if you're seeking to prevent a terrorist uh, uh, detonating a bomb or some such, it may be that your privacy has to be violated to achieve that. So the one of the contexts in which privacy comes up, which is uh, a, a somewhat fraught issue and a lot of controversy and so on, is in relation to, to encryption, and in particular, very strong forms of encryption, uh, such as, for example, it's end-to-end, uh, -end, so-called end-to-end encryption, 
And so a question arises that the, it's problematic. On the one hand, end to end corruption, end to end corruption. Encryption is very important um, due to protect your privacy. On the other hand, it also protects the privacy, confidentiality, or secrecy of the life of uh, organized criminals. Uh, and enables them to function on the dark web and so on, do all manner of things, which is uh, extraordinarily harmful. And so the question arises as to uh, what, what what's to be done in this in this space. So an initial point I think is that it's not true. If, if privacy is not an absolute word, it can be overridden under certain circumstances. Then it may well be the case that there are going to be some circumstances some empirical conditions, let's say, as opposed to um, ethical, distinguish between empirical conditions and ethical principles. There may be some conditions in which very strong encryption, including end-to-end -end encryption, um, um, ought, ought to be legally impermissible. That is, the right to privacy is overridden in those, in those circumstances. Given for example, the needs of law enforcement. So, so that may be a general point that needs to be made, that there is no absolute right to privacy and therefore there, be, there, may, there may, may well be certain conditions in which very strong forms of encryption uh, will not be legally, legally permitted, supposing that's possible. On the other hand, um, it may be that very strong end-to-end -end encryption is morally justified under certain conditions, for example, one can imagine people using devices in an authoritarian state, the state itself is a large part of the problem, or there's a severe threat, an ongoing threat posed by cyber criminals to citizens, such that citizens are not actually able to be protected from these criminals other than by the use of strong forms of encryption, including, say, end to end encryption. So law enforcement actually can't protect them, so they have to protect themselves, in which case it may be that. Um, there's no alternative to enabling them to have that strong form of encryption. Another, another circumstance might be that, well, law, if law enforcement has got other means to access the communications of organised crime, so for example, the use of uh, track people using these bulk metadata, they can hack uh, their phones, they can insert we a snooping device and so on and so forth. If they have other means to bypass encryption effectively, then it may be that there's no need um, for them to, to for, there's no need for them to, uh, for the law to legislate against uh, strong forms of encryption. Okay, so that's just by way of an example. Um, to sh uh, the point of the example is, look, we've got, We've got certain rights in play here, say the right to privacy. We've got other important considerations, uh, harmfulness. We've got law enforcement needs on the one hand. We've got um, what the criminals are doing on the other hand. And it, there's a need to get clear, I would suggest, on what the relevant principles are and how strong they are, the, the, the ethical principles. But at the same time, we've got to apply them in different contexts. And it may be that um, what the policy ought to be or what the legislation ought to be uh, varies depending on the nature uh, of the context. Okay, so let's move on and look at another um, another kind of example. Um, the example here is sort of social media and disinformation and so-called computation propaganda. So you think of Cambridge Analytica, the firm um, which was made use of big data and AI to um, target uh, relevant voters, particularly in marginal seats, with a view to um, causing the elections to go in a different a way other than they might have gone absent their intervention. So it's a, an inter, inter, using technology effectively to uh, inter, interfere in, in the democratic electoral process, or um, in the hands of um, well, some foreign powers, notably Russia and China, there's the use of these um, the bulk data and, um, and AI and, and alongside bots and so on, so troll farms and so on, to influence um, lots of the elections, but to, in a more general sense, to uh, influence um, attitudes and behaviour 
in the population, including uh, notably by way of driving uh, polarization. So traditionally, um, we had the great powers, for example, the Soviet Union, pumping out a, a particular ideology, uh, an anti-capitalist pro-communist ideology, and other great powers pumping out other sorts of competing uh, ideologies. But with a lot of the with a lot of the um, current um, interventions by particularly by Russia, but also by China, um, they're more interested in polarizing. So they'll drive this message, um, pro-Trump message here, uh, uh, an anti-Trump message there. So the idea is that this isn't so much to sell a particular ideology, so much as to just to get people of one another's throats to generate um, um, and manufacture conflict. And that is great. That that political, those political purposes are, are greatly enhanced by the use of um, social media, for example, using AI and, uh, and big data and so on. Okay, so an issue that then comes to fore at this point is given the uh, use by different on the level of individuals and groups and, and, and the state actors. Um, what, what should be done about this in relation to say uh, social media companies such as uh, such as Facebook, Twitter, now X and so on and so forth. But there's a question if you like about uh, the nature of these institutions and the design of these institutions and whether or not these institutions are fit for purpose and indeed prior question as to well what actually what is the purpose that they serve or what purpose ought they to serve. Um, so for example it now emerges that you know, Facebook that, that using all of algorithms that essentially drive sensationalistic content at the expense of is it evidence-based content um, that they um, with certain so-called whales, big influences and, uh, um, at the expense of others and so on and so forth. And indeed, the, the primary sort of driving motive is um, to maximise the average uh, time spent per day by users on the, on the social media with a view to increasing uh, uh, advertising revenue. And is that problematic, uh, it, it does seem to be, and what, what if anything can be done about it in terms of redesigning or regulating uh, those, those institutions. Okay, so elsewhere I proposed um, what I refer to as a normative theological, normative theological account of institutions. So, so the idea is that well, we need to sort of step back from uh, social media companies and, and the infrastructure that they provide and ask ourselves, well, what is the nature of these institutions and what what kind of institutions should they be? What, what should their purposes be? Um, what benefits should they be providing? And, and then think about how they should be uh, redesigned or regulated in order to uh, serve those those purposes, um, and the and the idea of that of that kind of normative theory, which is a theory about all, what as it were we're all going to be facing in relation to institutions, is to is to think of institutions as essentially kind of joint enterprises that deliver various kinds, hopefully deliver various kinds of benefits uh, to the communities in which they're embedded. And in particular, deliver various kinds of collective goods. So, if you think about some of the existing institutions, well, what are some of the institutions? What are some of the goods that they're meant to be providing? So, if you think of police services, presumably they provide uh, something like um, law and order. Or if you think of universities, presumably they're providing um, collective goods in the form of um, knowledge or capacity to apply knowledge. Uh, and so on. If you think of, say, uh, the housing industry, and now we're looking not just at a single uh, 
single organization, you're looking at a whole industry, you're a housing industry, which is a market based uh, institution, the housing industry, ask ourselves well, what, what's the point of the housing industry? Why, why do we have it? What purpose does it serve? Presumably, the idea would be what it ought to be doing, what it ought to be doing is providing an adequate supply of housing for the community of reasonable quality and at a reasonable price. So if, for example, as is the case in many cities in the world, the housing industry is not achieving that, housing is incredibly expensive, there's not enough housing, or in some instances, uh, in some places, it's, it's very poor quality, then that industry, I would argue, is failing in its ultimate purpose. The justification for having the housing industry as a market-based industry and competition and all the rest of it is that that delivers that larger purpose. Okay, so in the same way, uh, it, it seems to me we just need to step back and think, think about this with social media companies uh, along the same lines. They're, they're human inventions, they involve a lot of people cooperating and competing, um, but what, what is the purpose that they want to be serving, or what are the multiple purposes they want to be serving? Are they serving those if not? What can we do to redesign them? Okay, so one distinction that kind of useful perhaps to think about in relation to institutions is institutions that are essentially epistemic. By that mean, I just mean that they're kind of essentially knowledge focused versus institutions that are not essentially epistemic. Their, their, their main purpose isn't, isn't knowledge. Well, now all institutions you know, have uh, and rely on knowledge acquisition and dissemination, but some are principally and ultimately focused on knowledge, and, and these would be institutions such as universities, presumably, whereas car manufacturers may be designing cars and so on, but ultimately their ultimate purpose is actually to make things and in particular make cars. So it's a, it's a kind of useful distinction, I think, to keep in mind. When we talk about, then if we were to talk about um, companies uh, like the social media companies, a question would be, well, are they meant to be essentially, since they involve all of communication and, and including communication with respect to knowledge, beliefs, understandings, perspectives, and so on, people giving the views, are they, should they be thought of as primarily epistemic institutions? And if they are to be thought of as essentially epistemic institutions, are they fit for purpose? Or an alternative view might be, well, they're not actually um, epistemic institutions themselves, they're just platforms that enable people to communicate and, and transmit information for its clients. So they're not essentially epistemic institutions, rather they're platforms that enable other, uh, that enable epistemic interaction and include and enable indeed, some other institutions that are epistemic institutions, such as, for example, news media corporations or universities to, to to communicate on on their on their platforms um so in that sense um they're a bit more like telephones i mean telephones are infrastructure people communicate them people communicate knowledge understandings as well as many other things um but it's not the business of the telephone companies to get into content they're not there to censor content to curate content uh to do anything with respect to content other than enable it to travel on the on infrastructure. So what's the appropriate the question is what's the appropriate model uh, for social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, and so on? Well, how should we how should we view them? Should we view them as essentially epistemic institutions or should we view them merely as infrastructure platforms where, where epistemic interaction, epistemic communicative interaction um, or, or should or there some sort of hybrid um, and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of question that I'm looking at in this, uh, in this section. So, well, let's think of some of the potential, um, what I'm referring to as collective goods that we might want this kind of technology and these sorts of companies uh, to deliver. And one, one kind of collective good, which is um, perhaps somewhat um, difficult to grasp, 
is is the idea of, of a kind of public forum for political communication. So this is the idea that in a community, um, there's a lot of communication which is necessarily about you know, democracy, certainly about, about political issues, about public policy and so on. And we need a kind of forum where different views can be uh, expressed, which everyone participates in, at least to the extent of, of listening to what's, what's been said. And that public forum idea was, was provided uh, in liberal democracies at any rate for over the last hundred years or so to a large extent by the mass media, by newspapers, by media news, and so on and so forth. Um, and now it looks as though we have a new kind of technology which enables, amongst other things, enables people to directly communicate with one another rather than by way of mediating institutions such as the press, such as TV and so on. And that, that's kind of exciting. Um, and that seems like it's a good thing. But it turns out that a totally unregulated um, site is based on specifically an unregulated um, an unregulated social media company creates a whole lot of problems in terms of echo, echo change and spread of propaganda and conspiracy theories and so on and, and a whole of illegality and site of violence, hate speech, defamation, and so on. Um, and, and so it's problematic, even though it's, it has these wonderful new opportunities, it, it, it has this, this profound and problematic downside. But at any rate, the collective good that, or one of the collective goods that we, we, uh, we seem to, which is important in liberal democracies, is, is to have something like a public forum. So let's just think about um, how social media companies um, could be, and, and, and that part of cyberspace could be, could be redesigned or regulated in a manner that facilitated rather than undermined the concept of a public forum, which is to say a whole bunch of people getting to um, express their views, but where the the rules, as it were, the implicit rules were that you uh, you said what was true, you tried to use provide evidence for what you said, um, and, and you had serious discussions rather than um, a kind of debased form of public communication, which is seemingly what, unfortunately, to a considerable extent, we have at the moment. So in that, in relation to that particular kind of uh, collective good, as I'm referring to it, as, as the public forum, public forum in which standards, epistemic standards of truth-telling and evidence based um, communication and so on were the norm, um, what would be the role of the social media companies? So on one, on one kind of view, you'd say, well, the social media companies are not and can't be and should not be epistemic institutions. Um, they should just be the infrastructure. So they should just be like the telephone companies. So that they shouldn't be the content. They shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be, um, Regulating content, they shouldn't be curating content, they shouldn't be uh, they shouldn't be censoring content by cutting out certain people, they shouldn't be using algorithms to um, uh, to push certain content at the expense of other content and so on. So it just should be that should be those tasks should be performed by some other institution or combination institution. So that'd be kind of one view. Um, is that a possible, um, is it possible to have that arrangement? Could they be, could we, could, could they be structured in such a way that you simply had no role with respect to content? Maybe, maybe not. Um, that, that view seems to be inconsistent at any rate with the current uh, arrangements. And specifically, that view seems to be inconsistent with social media companies primary and ultimate goal, primary and ultimate goal, is simply to maximize user hours per day in order to facilitate revenue from advertisements because that goal is not one that is consistent with 
uh, evidence based truth telling and the public forum. It's 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 a different kind of goal, and it turns out that it's actually um, the evidence seems to be in that it's actually quite inconsistent with uh, a well regulated that is well regulated by epistemic norms of truth telling evidence based communication inconsistent with with the notion of a public forum. Um, rather, it seems to drive a kind of mindless, somewhat mindless slipping of one using, using uh, media to communicate in a, in a somewhat mindless manner and, and, and allowing people to manipulate in various ways by, for example, um, the drugs and some sensations of content and so on and so forth. Okay, so one way to go then is to redesign the social media companies um, in order to try to think about how to redesign them in a manner that enables them to contribute in a more satisfactory manner to this concept of a public forum uh, in which there's compliance with the norms of truth telling evidence based communication and so on. Um, so here's here's some suggestions. Um, one is to hold them uh, liable in the way that we can hold publishers liable for unlawful content or, or, or and, and for content which is subject to civil civil right, also defamation. So incitement defamation that becomes something that they are liable for. Another way of doing this would be to achieve this would be then to license holding liable for these um, illegalities but also license them um, in a way that we li we license media companies so if they fail to comply over a sufficient period of time and they lose their license and they're out of, they're out of business another way another kind of um, regulatory move would be to require anyone who has a, an account to be registered with some independent statutory authority such as the National Safety Commission in Australia. Um, and so you couldn't actually have an account unless you were, you were identified on the basis of the passport. So that in principle, it could be known who you are. Now that doesn't mean that when you're communicating on social media, and that's so nicely right. But the point is that in principle, it could be found out who you are. So we know if it was a fake account, we know if um, you know you, you were some overseas ent entity and so on and so forth. That is, the law enforcement people who could in principle get to know that. And obviously, there would be protections that you don't have that access to that information under warrant and so on and so forth. Secondly, um, the second, so there are a raft of sort of regulatory things that could be done and would, would require quite a lot of international uh, uh, international agreements and so on, but on the EU it looks like it's already, that's it, which is a big, a, a big global energy going down that track. Um, a second sort of different kind of suggestion would be to build in structurally some of the institutions that are subject to quality control, as it were, although arguably not sufficient, not sufficiently. But, um, so with with newspapers, with newspapers, news organisations, and universities, that their their communications and, and their epistemic interactions, their knowledge focused activity, is subject to some form of quality control. And therefore, it could well be that they mandatorily were sort of structured and embedded into the into social media companies, so that they had to have um, they had to have the content from these uh, these uh, organisations, these institutions, and the viability, financial viability of that could be uh, ensured in different ways, but including by getting them a piece of the, the bigger piece of the advertising revenue. So for example, when recently in Australia, Facebook said, well, we're not, we're, we're not, uh, we're not we've, got, we've got all this content from, from uh, news organizations, 
Um, but we're not going to pay for it. Um, just take the content and um, uh, we own it, and that's the end of it. And uh, if they don't like it, then they, they, uh, they can go elsewhere. Of course, it's very hard for them to go elsewhere given the old office situation with social media thing. The thought would be well, actually, first of all, it's mandatory. You can't actually, so if it's a recognizable, identified, and fully licensed news media organization, it's got a right to uh, a place in, in the social media company. And secondly, it's got a stream of revenue by virtue of the fact that it's providing um, high quality content. Okay, so that's a bunch of suggestions that. Uh, and again, with a lot of these suggestions, it amounts to well, will, 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 does it work? Will it work? Is it something to be uh, thought about and um, implemented if it works and not if it doesn't work and so on? But I think the principle, the principles are nevertheless um, ones that I would want to uh, hold to, namely uh, the social media companies are no different from any other human institution. Ultimately, they're there to facilitate. The well being of individuals and collectives. And they need, if they're not doing that, then they need to be redesigned and regulated in a manner to ensure that they do. Um, okay, so my third example is um, cognitive warfare, sort of a tenet, which is related somewhat to the, to the issue of what I've referred to as computational propaganda, which I've mentioned before, which is again. Uh, implicated in disinformation, spreading propaganda, and so on online. But let me give you a, a more, um, more targeted, uh, more targeted definition. Cognitive warfare emerged from primordial kinetic forms of warfare, such as psyops operations, and think of information warfare, which is motor warfare conducted. Um, Often war, where one side brings a spins all this stuff out to try and uh, assist with the war effort um, to build confidence in their own people and undermine the confidence of the person with the enemy. Uh, but of course, information warfare has been given a, um, a huge boost by all this new technology, uh, notably in artificial intelligence. Techniques of new techniques of psychological manipulation, big data, and so on and so forth. And with current wars, for example, in um, Ukraine, the Russians are involved in hybrid warfare, where on one hand they're in the trenches fighting fighting the Ukraine, but on the other hand they're using occupation propaganda uh, to try to undermine the Ukrainian citizenry and uh, involve their own people, and so on and so forth. And of course, they've been involved in these practices in relation to uh, elections in, in the US and presidential elections in the US. So, a couple of quotes um, Cognitive warfare is a strategy that focuses in altering how a target population thinks and through that, how it acts. Um, the weaponization of public opinion by external media for the purpose of influencing public and governmental policy and destabilizing the public institutions. So another example would be um, China who wants to retake, um, take over uh, Taiwan. And so it's got an ongoing, um, ongoing issue of problem with warfare against uh, West China and Taiwan. It's quite a complex um, ongoing operation. So that's cognitive warfare. Uh, and uh, actually, states can wage this kind of warfare against some of the members of their own population. Um, you know, in the of the China state against the leaders um, in Xinjiang. Okay. Um, so the problem with there's a, there's a number of problems with cognitive warfare. So if you're Cognitive warfare makes use of this disinformation, propaganda, psychological manipulation, and so on and so forth. Either as part of hybrid warfare, that is, there's actually a hot war, a kinetic war, and this is part of that, or just uh, without, without there being a hot war. It's just a, a, a cognitive warfare enterprise without the attendant use of kinetic force, not firing any guns or shooting anyone, 
But just to engage in this ongoing um, enterprise of disinformation propaganda and so on. Now, it's somewhat problematic uh, for liberal democracies to try to combat or counter cognitive warfare because um, the liberal democracies, at least, um, ought to be committed to the principles of freedom of communication. Um, they're also committed to principles of evidence-based truth telling, hopes to be in the public sphere, particularly in the most political matters. And so spinning a whole lot of propaganda or trying to manipulate people or alternatively censoring various content is highly problematic for liberal democracies that want to live by their own principles. And it's particularly problematic outside the context of a hot war. Maybe one thing to engage in that sort of activity, say in the context of the Second World War, where the um, there's a sort of there actually is an existential threat to the nation. You use existential threats and we multiplied them in recent time. It was an existential threat. But um, outside sort of hot wars, um, it's peacetime effectively. It's highly problematic for liberal democracies to engage in, in cognitive warfare themselves, even if they are the objects of, uh, of attack. Okay. Um, so what are some of the things that might be able to be, might be, able to be done? Um, and I'll go through and just, given the time constraints, sort of slam down a whole bunch of them and you can tell me why, I don't know what's wrong about them or, or, or what you like about them, I feel something specific. But one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about um, freedom of communication the freedom of communication is a very fundamental human right, and it's a particularly important one in liberal democracies. Uh, liberal democracies are very strongly committed to freedom of communication. But in relation to freedom of communication, I think it's important to get clear on what exactly is the fundamental human right of freedom of communication. The, the basic home of that notion of a human right of communication is individuals, individual human beings, communicating with one another freely. It's, it's important to see that that notion is not the same notion as very large organizations uh, with very large megaphones communicating messages that are in their interests. There is no such basic right to the freedom of communication that attaches to organizations per se. The fundamental human right is, a, is, is as it suggests, it's the right of human beings, of individual human beings to interact with one another. So when we start talking about um, the communications of powerful organizations, including youth media organizations, and governments and, and so on, we need to just keep that in mind um, because it's not the same thing. And the communications that such organizations have, a, um, or their members have a right to engage in, are restricted, I would suggest, or ought to be restricted to the purposes of those institutions. So it's one thing for the CEO of a large company to publicly communicate that individual's uh, views as the CEO of that organization in relation to matters that um, pertain to the appropriate purposes and activities of that organization. In other words, to make his view, let's say, or view known about um, the latest government policy in relation to killing mining, if it's a mining company. It's quite another for that individual to take upon themselves to use the large megaphone that he has in all the all the, all the individuals he might have and the technology he might have to communicate his his or her personal views about a whole range of matters that have got nothing much to do with the purposes of that organization. So when we're talking about um, those large organizations, including news media organizations, we need to just keep that in mind. And journalists, for example, have a right to communicate, um, but they have a right to communicate on matters that are in the public interest, and if they've researched those 
those issues um, well and in the context of um, the distinction between editorial independence from owners and so on and so forth. So it shouldn't be the case that it's just Rupert Murdoch, for example, that happens to be an owner of a large company making known his views on whatever matter he likes to likes to uh, uh, participate on. Because that is not the same thing as the individual human right to engage in personal communication. Okay, so keeping that in mind, um, when it comes, we come back down to cognitive warfare, um, it's per if, if we're talking about states, uh, foreign states or, or, or mass media uh, organizations uh, owned or controlled by foreign states, they do not have a right to, they're not exercising the human right to communication when they push the propaganda or whatever it is that they're pushing. So there isn't, there isn't the same problem about restricting them or shutting them down as they would, that would not be a violation of the human right of freedom of communication. It would be shutting down an organization which arguably is not engaged in the kind of uh, communication appropriate to that organization. So if, for example, um, uh, yeah, right, okay, so let, I'll finish on this point. If, if for example, um, uh, the members of the Australian or the members of the British or the English community or whatever, some state, if they decide um, through their members of parliament that they no longer want to hear um, various forms of communication from some Russian-based government entity, then it's perfectly appropriate for them to shut that down because that is not a violation, what may be perfectly appropriate for them to do that, because it would not be a violation of, of anyone's freedom of, of that human right to freedom of communication. It could still be the case, though, that it would be consistent with that individual human members of uh, Australians or whatever uh, listening to and communicating uh, interpersonally with Russian citizens and so on and so forth. That, that could go on uh, undisturbed and uncensored, but the communication of those uh, powerful organizations could well be appropriate and curved. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not going to Questions? Anybody online with questions? We were talking about journalists having the freedom of expression on matters of public interest. Who set the topics of public interest, if not the leading interest? Um, well, it's like a lot of these things. Um, you do, we do, we all do. Um, the 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 topics that are in the public interest are the ones that are uh, in the public interest, and of course, a whole lot of people will have to make judgments about that. Um, but um, we need to know that the people who are making those judgments, um, the editors and the journalists. First of all, that they're not they're not the judgments of the owners, hence the importance of editorial independence, right? We need to know that they are uh, people who are, who are fresh professionals who are focused on uh, what's what's important and what the members of the public think is important, um, and over a long period of, that they're well trained. That they're focused on those issues, that they're not inappropriately motivated by considerations of how much money they're making, and so on and so forth. Um, and and we need to, we need to they need to be, so we need to also think of, that's why we have professional journalists who blah blah blah. There's a whole raft of I mean the, the world of journalism has gone has been around for a long time as a profession. There's a whole raft of considerations and a whole raft of policies uh, to try to ensure that, that the judgments they make are, by and large, and over time, good judgments. 
Some of those things are, as I said, editorial independence from owners, don't have owners in the period. The, the, the journalists are well trained. The companies are to some extent isolated from commercial pressures so that they can make informed judgments without just being driven by considerable commercial considerations. Another kind of important aspect of this is that um, is that they have a distinction between news and content, uh, sorry, news and uh, uh, comment. So that there's a sharp distinction between factual news, which they must strictly adhere to and, and comment, and we know what the, the difference is. Um, another aspect of, of journalism is that they make use of people who are not the experts to come and speak and they provide them with platforms um, to, to speak on matters. And, and, and yet a third aspect is that you've got a public, which is you know, reasonably well-educated, reasonably well-focused. Um, you need a whole range of different, um, of different uh, uh, um, policies and, and practices and, um, and so on, and institutions in place so that it, you get a situation where um, there's not too much economic interference, there's not too much political interference, um, and there are a whole range of things that can be done and have been done to ensure that. Um, but if you instead, if you just ignore all that, you just ignore that, and you allow owners to dictate, you know, what the company says, or the news people, the news uh, company says, and you allow journalists to just get into that, you know, you collapse the distinction between information and comment, you collapse the distinction you get into advertorials, which collapse the distinction between information and advertisement, and, you start, and you've just got this mishmash, and it's all driven by making money, for example, or driven by a state-based and authoritarian regimes, state-based agency, then you just got to scramble the whole thing and you end up with, you know, propaganda, disinformation, so on and so forth. So there, it, it is difficult, but we, we, we've got a reasonable idea about how to design institutions that, that work in this space. Mm -hmm. And with, when it's come to the social media, um, it just hasn't been thought hard enough about. And there's a whole lot of nonsense about, um, well, it's, I own it, therefore I can do what I want. There's, there's no, there is no principle such that because I've got a lot, of, a lot of money and I bought this institution, therefore I can have a right to speak on political matters that no one else has. And a mega, there's no right to have the big megaphone that no one else has. That's just because I've got a lot of money. That just doesn't follow. Um, and if we need a uh, public thought, if, if the matters that need to be communicated about, discussed and argued about and so on, and think about the political matters that are important, we need a public forum, that trumps commercial consideration, or should trump. Um, but the answer to you, it's a good question. Is it, the answer is a bit complex, but it's available. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned at the beginning the distinction between cyber security and cyber safety. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. It seems like a really interesting concept, but does that mean you sort of draw a distinction between if it's a cyber safety issue, then you know the corporations might not be held to accountability if something goes wrong in the same way that if it's a cyber security issue, you know, somebody should really regulate that. Yeah, so, so the distinction I made, cyber safety is a sort of, act, act, if you like, largely accidents where cyber security, either someone intended to do harm or they behave culpably, culpable negligence, perhaps recklessness. Um, but you need to have regulation about But I mean, security issues then protect other things being equal, right? It's the same amount of harm done. Security tends to be a more serious matter and, and indeed a criminal matter uh, because of the intention or, or the net or the of negligence, whereas uh, some of the other issues may not be. On the other hand, a lot of safety issues are so serious, it's so seriously problematic that I mean the fact that it was an accident is neither here nor there. If you haven't got if you haven't uh, if you haven't done all the things that you need to do that and the metal Requirement safety and health requirements, for example, then you're going to be uh, quite rightly uh, in the firing line, including um, potentially criminally. So it's the distinction doesn't 
I think it's important to have the distinction, but the distinction is not such that it obliterates, if you like, the accountability of those who fail to put in place and comply with safety as opposed to security regulation. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, so maybe I misunderstood, but at some point you suggested that maybe the purpose of these social media companies is to provide a, a public forum. Is a purpose. A, a purpose. A purpose. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm, I'm suggesting that they should have as one of their purposes that. Okay. Yeah. Could you elaborate on the other purposes? Uh, well, I think, I mean, a lot of the other. Ones. So if you're talking about, let's say, uh, private communications using Facebook or whatever, I and mean, then uh, friends interacting on Facebook or I mean, uh, private communications are just what we find. Um, I think uh, that's not a public, that is a function and it's an important and useful function for them to have. Um, uh, it's not the same thing. And it's fine that they have that function. And, Great. I mean, these small groups of people with, with common interests and want to interact and so on and so on. So there's a whole lot of things that those social media um, companies and that kind of technology can do that are not providing a public forum for political communication. So it has a whole lot of other purposes. Um, the only thing I'd say about all of that is that it's still, insofar as those other functions, um, uh, being undermined by a whole lot of unlawful activity. And if, you're, if, if we're talking about people engaging in, in you know, child sex abuse, women, we're talking about people engaged in using those um, those facilities to engage in a whole lot of unlawful activity. Then the points what goes to what goes to that is some of the points about the regulatory points. I don't see. Um, so, so I, I think that, um, for example, insisting that account holders be, in principle, able to be identified, so that if they do engage in those activities, law enforcement know know who they are, identify them. Um, that, that they just still need to be regular, but that is a different kind of purpose, and fine. So my concern here is principally with, with, with you know, the. The idea of the importance of um, reform for public political communication. But I mean, yeah, the whole graph of other things, uh, which those social media can perform and usefully do so. But I think there's, even in those other areas, I think there's a need for some sorts of regulation, particularly, I mean, most specifically in relation to unlawful activity. <clears throat> Uh, you talk about uh, the right of you know, communication rather than than the right to free speech. First, uh, is there a new kind of right? What do you usually you talk about? Free speech? Yeah. I think also there's a debate about when free speech should be restricted. Yeah. Yeah. For instance, in the case of free speech, the, the European statement on hate speech is that, that it should be restricted for uh, the, the American approach will be that in so far as it, it doesn't yeah. it's a, a threat, an immediate threat to anybody. Yeah. It's, it's, so, yeah, 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 right. So um, so I've used the, the term freedom of communication is a bit broader because speech implies a take it language. Um, whereas free communication can be obviously embraces free speech, but it's wider because there are the possibility of communications which aren't strictly speaking speech, and there could be images, for example, or, or whatever. But um, but in relation to your other to your other point, absolutely. I mean, free speech, um, there is no total um absolute free speech. I mean, the incitement is an obvious statement. There's, there's all sorts of speech that is restricted. Um, liberals, uh, I think, reasonably, uh, uh, see myself as a, as a liberal in the liberal tradition, quite rightly don't want to restrict uh, 
free speech and freedom of communication um, will generally, um, except under, um, except in highly specific and um, justified circumstances, such as such as incitement, um, such as uh, you know, the other defamation, uh, and there's a whole there's a whole range of um, cases. I mean, another interesting category of cases is speech which provides someone with the means to do great harm. So you may want to, for example, restrict speech um, pertaining to um, the, the uh, means to um, um, to, to make highly virulent, highly transmissible pathogens, which if released could destroy large populations. Here, say, well, no, no, sorry, we're going to have to we're going to have to censor some of that that scientific work and make it only available and so on and so forth. So there's a there's a good there's good reason, and, and of course you uh, there's all sorts of confidential and private information that needs to be restricted and so on. Um, the the hate speech thing is interesting because, as you say, um, the US generally is um, rather more permissive when it comes to free speech and particularly bad speech than, say, the Europeans. Um, I think, uh, without getting into the debate about that, I think the point is that, as with most things, so with the right to free speech that and the right to privacy and so on, there's, there's certain things that I think most um, reasonable people would say, well, that's, that should not be restricted. And then there are other things that most people would think a bit about it and say they should be restricted. And so you'll get quite a lot of commonality, for example, in um, European, uh, European rights with respect to free speech and the US. But then there are some there's some areas and hate speech is, is a good one where there's there's quite a lot of disagreement and it just has to be we just have to be argued argued through we just have to look at what the case is and, and maybe some formulations of some legislation in relation to hate speech is um, overly restricted overly restrictive. Um, and perhaps others is not as it's too the US is too permissive in certain respects. But the other thing I think to bear in mind there, which comes back to some of the things I started off saying, I think it does depend to some extent on the context. I mean, the most obvious examples is you may want to restrict speech um, when you're at war, for example, in ways you wouldn't in peacetime. But you also might you might think that um, in relation to, for example, Germany. In, in the light of um, you know the Holocaust and all the rest of it, you might think, well, you know, maybe the Germans um, reasonably ought to have more restrictions on freedom of communication and free speech um, in matters pertaining to those issues than than the US uh, or the you know, So there's 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 aspects of context that also might be. Uh, might be relevant, but yeah, I, yeah, I think the hate speech thing is a good example where there's, I think, reasonable people can can, uh, can differ, and maybe um, some hate speech uh, restrictions are too restrictive, and, and some are not restrictive enough. You know. We would have to get into the weeds um, to address that, you know, adequately. 